Alright, hello. Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, may I um, ask uh, if everyone's doing okay? If everyone's here, can you give me some reacts? Some hearts, some party emojis. Alright, thank you so much. Yes. Okay. Um, well, first and foremost, I'm Rosen Hilario, uh, a faculty member of the Philippine Arts Program, and I will be your moderator and host for today's sessions. Uh, well, I must say I'm really excited for today's uh, sessions or uh, to, to hear from our speakers for today because I'm very sure that we will be learning uh, a lot as we did from yesterday's discussions. Uh, we learned so much about how people from all over the world celebrate festivals that center on endemic flowers. In a way, we can see that, uh, or we can see and we can say that flowers have given us a way to connect and uh, be connected with each other through these flowers. But for us to have a more detailed summary uh, of yesterday's, um, uh, yesterday's discussions, uh, uh, well, I would, first and foremost, I would like to uh, to open today's uh, the second day of our Flores de Mayo uh, celebration or international conference. Uh, but first, again, I'd like to uh, to call on Ms. Jessalyn Basco, one of our Philip uh, our Phil Arts faculty, to give us a recap of yesterday's sessions. So there, so we can have a more detailed summary. Ms. Jess. Hello, um, Rosie. Maraming salamat. Um, and good morning, everyone. Let me present the synthesis of um, day one. So first and foremost, of course, uh, Dr. Honey Libertine Action Zarlabor welcomed the audience to the 2022 International Flores de Mayo Festival and Conference as the conference convener, providing an outline of the event schedule. And then uh, Professor Alice Sadeva, the department chair of the Departments of Arts and Communication in CAS UP Manila, then introduced Chancellor Dr. Carmen C. Padilla for the inspirational message. Chancellor Padilla highlighted the importance of the promotion, revitalization and conservation of our heritage, even in the time of the pandemic. She acknowledged the UPM solidarity with the nation in commemorating the Flores de Mayo Festival, sending wishes for it to be matagumpay at Mahalimuyak. For the first plenary, Floral Traditions in Manila, Assistant Professor Celia Bonilla in her presentation on NILAD provided a brief narration of the history of the city in relation to the flower or the plant, shedding a light on the existence of certain toponyms such as Pinila from NILAD and Quiapo from Quiapo, as well as several traditions like that, like that of Andan in the image of Nuestra Señora de Guía. Continuing from where Professor Bonilla left off, Marinel Completo, a student or a senior student uh, of BA Philippine Arts shared the Flores de Mayo in Ermita, Manila as an et auto-ethnography. She focused on Bota Flores, a tradition done in honor of the feast of the Nuestra Señora de Guilla, the oldest existing Marian image in the country. Sharing her own experience as Capitana, she shared the tradition's history and practices. And then Dr. Honey Libertin Action Sir Labor on, uh, presented Balik Sang Kahalamanan and viewed flora as a ground in cultural heritage uh, conservation. She shared the various initiatives and projects done by the Power Project alongside uh, various organizations and agencies, such as Empowered uh, Women, Empowered Ermita, where underserved women in a barangay and ermita was taught how to crochet an endemic flower like Milad, both as an entertainment and also as a form of capacity building. Going international, the second plenary focus on world floral uh, festivals. First, Cosette Griffin Kramer shared the French Lily of the Valley festivities in France. She shared some details about the wild flower, its habitat, distribution, as well as how the flowers can be worked with. Though the festivities were canceled in the past two years due to the pandemic, it went virtual and elected all of the candidate queens in order to show solidarity. Meanwhile, from Turkey, Yabu Selim Sirinoglu talk about the Turkish tulip called Blale, its history, methodologies, and associated symbolisms. He also talked about the Istanbul Tulip Festival and stressed how the climate change has affected the weather as well as the tulips in the recent years. 
The third presentation of this plenary focused on the other side of the globe in the United States in Bernadette Escalona Cooper's presentation on the Rose Flower Festival. Here she highlighted how flowers can tell a narrative, which in this case is that of diversity. Last was Shushil Srivastava's presentation on Indian flower festivals, such as the Tulip Festival, the Rose Festival, the Flower Show, the Sara Flower Show, International Flower Festival, Cherry Blossom Festival, and Lalbag Flower Show. Present throughout this plenary is the sentiment and idea that flowers play a big role in the art and tradition of expression. Then in the afternoon, moderated by uh, UP Manila's very own Dr. Rosario Rubite, the afternoon sessions uh, featured scientist heroes of Philippine flora. First is Mr. Fernando V. Aurigues, Philippine Hoyas, Plant Genetic Resources for Conservation and Sustainable Utilization, sharing Hoyas and Demicity publications, as well as few research undertakings and active Hoya groups in the country. Next, uh, Dr. Melanie Guillang addressed the questions, what should we know about alocasia, where she shared various endemic species of alocasia in the country, as well as several unresolved or distinct species. Last of the uh, afternoon sessions, first plenary is Dr. Teodora Balancot popularizing the stunning Benguet lily or Lilium Filipinense baker as an endemic species in the uh, Calderiera administrative region, where Dr. Balancot highlighted the need for conservation efforts amidst factors contributing to the decline of the species po and populations. Throughout the plenary, the scientists here stress that uh, there exist species that are critically endangered or vulnerable, and thus they call for the uh, conservation uh, efforts for this. The last session of day one, likewise moderated by Dr. Rivite, continued with Dr. Uh, Cecilia Moran's presentation on Philippine Xora, getting to know our own flame of the woods, which started with quite a nostalgic recall to sipping the uh, Santan's nectar and ended with a mnemonic uh, summarizing her presentation. And the last presentation was Dr. Esperanza Maribel Agoas' epiphytic um, Philippine orchids plant on trees, where she highlighted how number of species are uh, endangered uh, currently. She stressed uh, threats to biodiversity, such as indiscriminate logging, conversion of forests to other land uses, as well as the unsustainable production and consumption of plants for trade and domestic use. As we can see, uh, the presentation throughout the first day may have been varied, but a single core for uh, conservation was heard. It is therefore our responsibility as Filipinos to Philippine flora, as well as our cultural tangible and intangible heritage to safeguard its diversity in the present, as well as for the other generations to come. Um, so that's it for the summary of the first day. We hope that you will enjoy the next events today as well as in the coming days. All right, thank you very much, Mom Jess, or Jess, uh, for taking us back to yesterday's sessions. Uh, we have been reminded of how important traditional practices are to our artistic and cultural heritage and uh, how we are able to enrich these, um, these practices through, uh, well, particularly flowers. And I really love that we have this very beautiful theme uh, of uh, celebrating uh, the flowers during, well, uh, specifically in uh, the Flores de Mayo session. All right, thank you very much again, Jess. And uh, speaking of artistic and cultural heritage, uh, Philippine and Asian culture, even in the pre-colonial times, have been heavily influenced by nature. We already know that. Uh, our livelihood, our everyday necessities, and our rituals involve some elements of nature. That is why we give much importance to these natural elements, even in our artistic expressions. They have been the subject and inspiration of Filipino works of art in all forms, in all kinds of forms, maybe um, painting, performing arts, uh, our visual arts, performing arts, and then even in uh, literature and so on and so forth. As we celebrate Flores de Mayo, it is very essential that we commemorate and highlight the artworks that are inspired by nature's flora. In today's conference session, we will be hearing from speakers that will introduce us to the elegance, beauty, and meaningful influence of flowers in the world of art. It is just right that we celebrate Flores de Mayo 
by looking at the graceful contribution of flowers in artistry and creativity. I'm very excited for today's session. Well, I hope you are too. And I'm really excited to hear from our speakers today. All right, but before we start, uh, for the house rules, again, just like yesterday, we would like to request all participants here today to mute their microphones and until, uh, until asked otherwise. There will be a Q&A portion later, so if you have any questions, you can just list them down and ask them during the Q&A portions later. Okay, now I think we're all ready. I hope we're all ready. Um, maybe we can start with our uh, session speakers. All right. Our first speaker uh, is a graduate of BA Philippine Arts from UB Manila and is an advocate of Philippine endemic flora and fauna. She fell in love with Philippine endemic flora after she had an awakening that she had zero knowledge and about these beautiful species after she read an article about cherry blossom trees being planted in Benguet in 2015. She started her advocacy in 2016 through her tayaba or the jade vine and suwiyasoy or Benguet Lily paintings. Uh, her, her, four woman, her four one woman art exhibitions featured only artworks of Philippine endemic and indigenous flora and fauna. Advocacy for the conservation of flora and fauna through art inspired her to establish the Philippine Botanical Society and the Philippine Fauna Art Society in September 2019. In collaboration with botanists from the National Museum of Natural History, she believes that these two organizations will help promote raising awareness for the Philippines' endemic and native wildlife. In further pursuit of raising awareness for Philippine biodiversity, she began donating her Philippine eagle paintings to Philippine embassies and Philippine consulate general. She ultimately hopes her art can inspire the Filipino people to protect and conserve their country's rich biodiversity and its critically endangered species. Now, let's all welcome our first speaker, Ms. Bain Famoso Takan, founder of the Philippine Botanical Art Society, with her presentation entitled Floral Artists in Philbas. Morning. I'm so sorry, my, my Wi Fi connection got lost. So, anyway, um, thank you very much for that generous introduction, Ms. Razi, and to the FARA Project Executive Director, Dr. Honey Echensar Labor, um, to my fellow speakers, members of the academe, fellow artists, the Philippine Botanical Art Society, students, and guests. Magandang umaga po sa inyo lahat. I'm just, um, okay. Let's wait for my PowerPoint presentation. It's taking so long. Oh my. <laughs> oh there, okay. <laughs> Thank you. So anyway, um, I am being famoso. Takan, an advocate of Philippine endemic flora and fauna. And I am the founder of the two art societies, the Philippine Botanical Art Society and the Philippine Fauna Art Society. Okay, um, before I proceed with my talk, I would like to thank the FAURA Project for giving the Philippine Botanical Art Society an opportunity at this year's Flores de Mayo Festival and international conference to promote our shared advocacy of showcasing the beauty of our native flora, creating awareness and making known its importance as a natural heritage strengthens our Filipino identity. I am very happy that I have been a part of the FARA project for five years now. 
I was one of Dr. Hani's former students to join her at the very first Flores de Mayo Festival in 2018. Um, I think uh, because my presentation is about flora art, um, I think I have to send first my, my PowerPoint presentation to our admin because my, my Wi-Fi is very slow. All right, uh, Ms. Ming, we'll make sure to, uh, to get a copy of your PowerPoint so we will be uh, flashing it for you. Okay, for a while. <laughs> Um, Ms. Rosie, can, um, can we uh, skip first to my presentation? I, I just have to send this to chat. Oh, all right. So uh, is it okay if we move on to the next speaker from uh, Levy? Yes, go ahead. I was about to suggest that as well, that we can go to this next speaker. And then um, would you prefer to come after our second speaker, Dean? You will be our second speaker today, if that's fine with you. Yes, but uh, right. yes, but that's that, that will be fine. Thank you. All right. Thank you to be. All right. Thank you, Mom Levy. Okay. Uh, we will just go back to Miss Bing's pre presentation later. All right. So, uh, I would like to introduce first our next speaker. Uh, she was born on June 1, 1977, in Kuala Lumpur. Sorry, let me just put there. Uh, in Kuala Lumpur, she graduated. Graduated from Sekkep Gombak Setia, Selangor, and from a science boarding school in Pahang State for her primary and secondary education, respectively. She did not have formal education in art, but her passion for it had always grown. She then continued her studies at the Faculty of Art and Design at the University Technology Mara. Her degree was in textile design, but her love and drawing and uh, visual art made her fly to Tasmania. Australia for her master's degree in fine art and design. She is currently teaching foundation art in the same faculty. And as an alumna, giving back her knowledge and expertise is the best thing to portray uh, appreciation to the faculty and the society. Somehow, being an artist has always been her dream. She is now active doing artworks and joining local and international exhibitions. She is a member of a few artist groups such as Perupa, Malaysian Art Society, Rona, Penang Art Society, and also she's taking membership at the National Art Gallery in Malaysia. She is also founder of Lakar Wanita, a women artist group. And apart from creating artworks, she is also a batik painter and has won a few batik competitions worth thousands of ringgit in Malaysia. For her, batik is a Malaysian art and craft that has to be cherished and preserved. She produces modern and contemporary batik and technical motifs. She puts her interest and the character of women in visualizing artworks, and she talks about feminism and at the same time, enjoying animal characters through her own interpretation. Acrylic is her medium for her work, but recently she is more into drawing using charcoal and pencil. In the future, she aims to be a 3D drawing artist. And now to present her topic on endemic flowers in batik art, let's all listen to Ms. Zuriati Mohamed Shari or Zurin Shari. Hello and good day, everyone. Firstly, I would like to thank the organizer of 2022 International Forest, the Mayo Festival and Conference, for giving me the opportunity to be one of the speakers to share some knowledge on Malaysian Bati and usage of floral motif. I was informed that these two days conference will be followed by many interesting activities such as art exhibition and painting workshop. So congratulations to Dr. Hani Libertin Azanzar and the team for this successful event and also all the best to participants who are joining. 
Special thanks to my artist friend, Madam Bing Famoso, the founder of Philippine Botanical Art Society, for introducing me to the organizer and includes me to be part of the program. Me and being a friend since art program, the Philippine Malaysia Synergism 2018. And we have been keeping in touch since then. Topic that I would like to share with all of you today is floral design among winners of Palace Reendon or PSE Bati Art Competition. The reason I chose this topic is because throughout my journey in making Bati, I've been participated in this most prestigious Bati Award since 2004. It is an annual competition that offers big amount of money as the grand prize. For myself, I participated so many times and I won many prizes from consolation to the grand award. In 2011, I was lucky to be awarded with the first prize winner that was 30,000 ringgit Malaysia. And this was through handicraft category where I made batik products inspired by my creation character. The character was created hybrid with combination of tiger and dragon. Sorry. Um, this was during the exhibition after the first uh, prize giving ceremony at Kuala Lumpur Convention Center. So this was my uh, photo taken uh, together with my kids to celebrate my winning. And um, before that, let me explain what is Bati. So Bati is a traditional handcraft in Malaysia that is well known and appreciated by people from all walks of life. Malaysia has been a long history with the batik industry. Batik production grew from small scale operation to a profitable cottage industry and national enterprise. Batik refers to decorative fabric with a variety of colors and patterns. The term batik comes from the Javanese word thick, which means to drip or write points. Ambati is a word that means to draw, write, paint, or drip. A calf block, a screen, or a hand stroke can be used to create batik patterns. While Malaysia is not only country in the region that produces batik, the style and product of Malaysian batik differ from other styles. First, Malaysian batik artists use hand drawing techniques to create paintings on white cloth using chanting. The artist creates paint patterns with hot wax, then dyes the fabric to match. Second, the design which refers to the batik's painted or inlaid decorative patterns differ from that or other foreign batik producer. In Malaysian batik design, there are two main motifs, organic and geometric. Religious belief forbid the use of animals in design work, so floral and geometric patterns are used instead. Malaysian batik has gained popularity due to its indistinct nature and appearance, which is the result of nuances in both production and design. It is well known both domestically and internationally. Batik is the most popular handcraft product among Malaysians both locals and visitors. But it comes in third place among corporate buyers, trailing only pewter and woodcraft product. It is difficult to trace the origin of batik production in Malaysia. However, it is certain that the Javanese influence batik, uh, Malaysia batik making, both technically in terms of design development. Malaysian used wooden blocks to create batik like textile in the early days. Japanese batik makers introduced the use of wax and copper blocks on the East Coast as late as 1920s. Hand drawn batik production in Malaysia is relatively new and is related to Javanese batik tulis. In the 1960s, commercial production began. This craft has developed its own distinct aesthetic and design that is unique to Malaysia. The new Malaysian batik is clearly distinct from the hand-painted batik of Java. So um, first we have, uh, so we look at batik tulis, a batik tulis or right, batik right. 
The fundamental element of batik tulis is a practice in the traditional batik village where batik practitioner produce flora, fauna, geometric and abstract motifs because of their meticulous observation of nature and its surrounding. Batik practitioners are inspired by nature and its merit of living things to communicate the acquisiteness of God's creation through their batik tulis art. The motifs are created on the fabric with hot liquid wax using a metal tool called chanting in hand-drawn batik. Artists use brushes to paint the colors within the wax outline when the wax outlines are completed. Brushes can be used to make shaded and multi-hue designs. So these are the tool, the photo of the tools uh, for batik tulis. Um, another one is batik block. The block printing or block stamping is unique technique that existed in the early history of the Malay civilization. It is known as a piece of a wooden block with printed patterns stamped by hand or the fabric using natural dye. The motif and design are permanent on the block uh, and are applied repeatedly using one, two or more colors. The creation of the metal block transformed the manufacturing of stamping batik. The block batik is still produced in the East Coast states of Terengganu and Kelantan. The block batik is a popular item which used to decorate the fabric and continue to all generations. This is the way batik block is made from copper. Block will be dipped into wax and printed onto fabric. Then the wax will be removed and batik with single color is produced. To create multicolor, waxing with different block and de-waxing will be done many times. On December 1st, 2021, the Prime Minister of Malaysia, Datuk Sri Ismail Yaakob, Datuk Sri Ismail Sabri Yaakob, sorry, declared that a December 3rd every year as a Malaysian Batik Day. This coincides with the 3rd uh, December 2003 launch of the Malaysian Batik crafted for the world movement by the late Tun Datin Paduka Sri Endon Mahmud, wife of, wife of Malaysia's fifth Prime Minister, Tun Abdullah Ahmad Badawi. As part of the movement, the Palace Sri Endon Batik Design Competition is an annual event open to Malaysians. The competition that organized by Yayasan Budi Penyayang includes three categories, fashion, soft finishing, and handicraft. This research will look at the use of floral motif by competition winners beginning in 2003 until 2020. As what you can see on the slide is the trophy crafted from pewter with motif of hibiscus and traditional pucuk rebung. To enter this competition, um, participants must first submit idea and sketches on product together with batik sam sample. Judging session will be held by the appointed judges. Those who make through will have to submit for the second round. Normally 10 to 15 finalists for each category. At this point, all finalists will be presenting their product in the display or show for another judging criteria. This is an example of display for handcraft category and participants are given a table and all display is curated according to, uh, according to own creativity. For information, this is my product design year 2014. The design is inspired from Malay folk song. I really like this design but it wasn't, I wasn't lucky enough uh, because this one is not even get uh, a consolation. So this is an example for display for soft finishing category. Participants are required to produce at least five bedding items and display in a hotel room. Before that, participants must get the right measurement in order to get everything fitted. For fashion category, participants must produce four outfits and during judging, there will be fashion show conducted. Um, here, uh, Data that I have collected through um, website of Yayasan Budi Penyayang uh, organizer, Batik 
uh, or the or the organizer of Palis Rendon, Batik Guild magazine published by Yayasan Budi Penyayang and through own observation on floral design among winners of Palis Rendon since 2004 until recent. So in 2003, um, for the second prize winner, uh, Nazari Marus, uh, this designer used orchid for um, the motif. In 2004, for finishing first prize winner, the designer is Ridwan Bohari, and he used a motif of roses. In 2004, for finishing third prize winner, um, the designer Nur Atika used orchid. So in 2004, um, Muhammad Azhar Samin, the designer for second prize winner, used hibiscus as motif. In 2005, again, uh, orchid for the motif has been used by Ryan uh, and awarded with first prize uh, winner for fashion category. Still in 2005, hibiscus motif from Carl Ng won second prize for fashion category. And in 2010, um, for category soft finishing, Muhammad Nazlan won second prize and he used fern as motif. Still in 2010, um, this designer, this team, Avan team, uh, won second prize or fashion category, and they use sendudo or rhododendron as motif. In 2011, uh, Muhammad Rafizi Shari won second prize winner for fashion category, and he used Cambodia or Prefranjipani. In 2014, for soft finishing, second prize winner, Muhammad Nazlan used orchid. 2015, um, Pang Yi and Afik won third prize for fashion category and they use Lily as motif. So, uh, on the other hand, floral motif is also popular among participants. Next slides are some examples on batik products that were designed based on floral motif. So, these are uh, examples from other participants or other finalists. Um, some users still, I think, orchid and fern, and this one's orchid. This one is also orchid. So uh, many new talents have been appointed to become well-known de batik designers during the Palace Riandon competition duration. Whether they are champion or finalists, the potential for the Malaysian batik sector to grow is vibrant. As the organizer, Yasan Budi Penyayang provides them with numerous opportunities to further their careers. Some of the designers that have made a name uh, themselves in the local batik business are listed below. Some of them use floral motif in their design as can be seen in this, show, uh, in this showing slide. So this one, the first one is um, used by Zal from uh, company Kaki Batik. And this one is Masrina Abdullah from uh, Masrina Com Abdullah company. And she used a lot of um, floral motif as well for her design. This one is Fern Chua from company Fern Chua. So Fern Chua uses um, almost uh, all for uh, his her design um, with um, pastel colors and a lot of floral mot motif as well. And this one is Ami Harris from company Bujin. And as you can see here, um, for the design, he is using um, hibiscus as motif. All right. And for the conclusion, based on the findings of the research, I discovered that just a few of Palace Re and Dawn com competition winners incorporated floral motif into their design. Other motifs such as geometric, ethnic, and animal designs are used by the rest. Batik tulis techniques are used to create all floral-based motif. Using the block batik technique, 
none of the designers created designs based on the floral motif. They are all in the category of fashion and soft finishing, and none of them are from the category of handicraft. However, from a commercial standpoint, many fashion designers enhance floral motif in their designs. So with that, um, thank you for your time to listening to my um, presentation. Thank you so much. So, um, well, thank you very much, Ms. Zurin Shari, for sharing with us the artistry of batik uh, or batik painting and the influence of flowers as creative subject matter. It was really interesting how um, she was uh, also able to uh, educate us first about what batik is, the history of batik, um, the cultural background, and the, uh, the uh, processes of making batik in Malaysia. I really learned a lot from, from her presentation. But what was most uh, interesting for me was when she uh, when she discussed the, icono the iconography of flowers, not only in traditional and cultural painting, but in fashion as well. Uh, those clothes, those um, very fashionable clothes are very stunning. Yeah, so um, I hope uh, Ms. Zurin Shari will be joining us later. Uh, so she can answer some questions of yours if you have if you have some for her. All right. So I, I would just like to check first if uh Miss Bing is ready or Miss Bing's presentation is ready. Ah uh, yes, it's okay now. But I will not turn on my video anymore because it's I know <laughs> my Wi-Fi is really you know intermittent. So anyway, I sent my presentation to Miss Cha, and she'll be the one to share my presentation. Okay. So um, I was as I was saying earlier, I was very thankful that um, I am a part of the Fara project for five years now. And uh, Dr. Hani Achansar, she's very encouraging and inspiring. And she asked me to join the very first Flores de Mayo Festival in 2018. It was around this time that we celebrated it, where the participants walked along Padre Faura wearing sashes painted with endemic flowers. It was that time that I started advocating for endemic flora. Dr. Honey suggested to showcase the endemic flowers at the festival. My very first art workshop with the Fauda project was painting the endemic flowers on sashes that the students wore during the parade. As part of the festival, my second solo show entitled Pagsibol, Pagkamulat sa Kagandahan at Kalagahan ng Mga Katutubong Bulaklak was held at the UP Manila Museum of a History of Ideas. Let me share with you the CNN coverage of the event. This month, we celebrate one of the beauties of nature. Our Pauline Versosa tells us about one celebration for Flores de Mayo. To celebrate the Merry Month of Flowers, students of UP Manila launched a special activity entitled The Flower Project. The project gives an interesting twist to the Flores de Mayo tradition by promoting the endemic flowers of the Philippines. Well, since um, Philippine art students kami, syempre gusto din namin na ma-feature yung mismong flowers ng Philippines para mas ma-appreciate ang mga tao yung mismong flowers natin, mas makapag-raise ng awareness. Students paraded along Padre Farah Street in Manila on Thursday morning wearing sashes hand-painted with the Philippine endemic flowers such as the Doña Aurora, Waling Waling, and Kappa Kappa. The parade ended with a special exhibit entitled Pagsibol at the Museum of History of Ideas. Artist and endemic flora advocate Bing Pomoso shares that her inspiration is rooted on her desire to shed light on the neglected culture. I specifically um, plan to paint them so that to create awareness also how to conserve and preserve them. Because it's really hard if these flowers die. No, it's part of our natural heritage and our cultural heritage. And it speaks about us as Filipinos. So it's about high time to show the world who what is truly Filipino through our endemic flora. Project Power doesn't just aim to shed light on the country's unique flowers. It also seeks to make Padre Power Street a center of heritage and art in the city. 
Project convener and Professor Dr. Levy Labor says this was a great learning experience for her and her students and hopes the Filipino community will study more about the Philippines' endemic flora, especially during Flores de Mayo. They'll be here until Saturday, no? So it's kind of extended. So the week is kind of extended till Saturday, and uh, uh, we were informed that there will also be another workshop which will be open to the public this time. So you are all invited to also join the exhibit. Pauline Berzosa, CNN Philippines. During my talk at the exhibit opening, I excitedly shared my idea of putting up a botanical art society that will paint only native flora. Even if I want to, I will never be able to paint the more than 10,000 native flora species. Sharing the advocacy with a community of artists will accomplish the job. My advocacy started after reading a Facebook post about the cherry blossom tree planting in Benguet province. I felt sad after learning that the local government planned to launch a cherry blossom festival. Why should the attention be given to an exotic flower? We do not even have our own flower festival where we can appreciate the flower still intact and attached to the plant or tree. A flower festival where we can see our native flora. We have the panagbunga, but it only displays cut flowers that are exotic. That Facebook post fueled my interest to research our native flora species. I found out that the flowers that I was familiar with, like bunganvillea, calachuchi, roses, and dahlia, are exotic or introduced flowers. I vowed to myself that I will only paint endemic flora. I believe that if I paint them on big canvases, viewers will be interested to learn more about them. My solo shows, all four of them featured native flora. That second solo exhibition at the UP Manila of a Museum of a History of the Diaz was instrumental to the creation of Philbas. It was a very exciting journey that started with a visit to the Botany Division of the National Museum of Natural History in May 2018. I went there to hand over an invite to my exhibit and to present my idea of putting up a botanical art society to anyone I would be able to meet there. It was a very fortunate visit because that day I met three of our country's foremost botanists, Dr. Edwin Tadiosa, Dr. Danny Tandang, and Mr. John Ray Caliado, who were very, very supportive. Philbas was established a year after because the museum at that time was under construction and the three gentlemen were preoccupied with it. On September 4, 2019, exactly a year and four months after I first visited the Botany and National Herbarium Division of the National Museum of Natural History, Philippine Botanical Art Society was born. Philbas Vision is a community of artists painting only native flora species. Through visual arts, it aims to create awareness of our native flora and its conservation status as most species are now considered endangered. Moreover, the society intends to revive the botanical art style and encourage Filipino artists to paint our native flora in this art form. Presently, Philbas has 120 official active members who are passionately painting our native flora and actively creating awareness through visual arts. This is by far the art organization that has most members. It engages more than 100 Filipino artists in its advocacy to spread awareness about Philippine endemic and indigenous flora species through art. Since its establishment in 2019, Fieldbest has held six botanical art exhibitions and exhibited hundreds of artworks with only native flora as subjects. The exhibition with the flora project this year is the seventh exhibition. I am very excited to share with you that Philbas will have its eighth exhibition at the National Museum of Natural History from May 23, 2022 
until September 25, 2022. And another one will be in November 2022 at the Singapore Botanic Gardens with three other botanical societies from Thailand, Indonesia, and Singapore. The Philippine Botanical Art Society encourages and inspires everyone to use art as an expression of love for our biodiversity. I am happy to note that our members are from different sectors of our society. We have botanists, medical doctors, teachers, lawyers, a wife of an ambassador, and students as young as 10 years old. I believe that everything that our hands create is beautiful especially those that were created for nature. At this point, I am very happy and proud to share with you some of the botanical artworks of our Philbass members. The first featured artist is Mr. Danny Tendang. He is one of the three co-founders of Philbass. He is a botanist at the National Museum of the Philippines and is a main contributor for COS Digital Flora of the Philippines, the repository of native flora species. He is currently a PhD graduate student in Taiwan under the biodiversity program with full scholarship. Danny Tendang has accomplished a lot in the scientific field. He had various botanical explorations in different parts of the country where he documented and collected a wide variety of unique plant species. His discoveries added to the rich collection of the Philippine National Herbarium. Despite being busy with his PhD, he manages to draw and paint. So Cha, can we please um, show again his artworks? So this is the Amelothica Cleophae. And Dr. Danny Tandang asked me to illustrate this uh, newly discovered mistletoe and you will find this at Gallery 12 of the National Museum of Natural, um, Natural History. Second one is the Reflecia spichosa. And the last one is um, a scientific illustration of the begonia. So just imagine how Sir Danny, despite his being busy, was able to come up with these beautiful artworks and beautifully and scientifically correct artworks of these different um, species. So we go next to the second featured artist. Mr. John Ray C. Caliado is one of the three co-founders of Philbass. He is a botanist, museum researcher from botany and the National Herbarium Division of the National Museum of the Philippines. He earned his Bachelor of Science in Forestry, magna cum laude, from the College of Agriculture and Forestry, West Visayas State University. He has delivered various lectures and workshops about plant taxonomy, herbarium techniques, conservation, and botanical art. He has published various papers on new species of plants from the Philippines and a field guide book about ferns of Chiang Mai, Thailand. His research interests are pteridophytes, that's, those are ferns and lecophytes, various flowering plants, and gymnosperms. During his free time, he enjoys drawing flora and fauna. He is also active in sports like badminton, dragon boat, and trail running. He documented Philippine flora species while taking part in the 50 to 100K trail running in the Cordilleras. So let's take a look at Mr. Caliada's artworks. This is the Nephentas, uh, these are the Nephentas of the Philippines. So you will see there different species under this genus. Next one we have the Reflecia lunardi. And this is also um, part of the exhibit at the National Museum of Natural History. And you can find this at Gallery 12. And the last artwork is a forest stratification in lowland depterocarp forest. Our third featured artist is Carla Sahona. I, Isa Domingo, sorry. Isa Domingo is an artist illustrator from the Zoology Division of the National Museum of Natural History. She is a cum laude graduate of Bachelor of Fine Arts, major in painting from the University of Santo Tomas. Her illustrations and photographs has, have been published in scientific journals, such as the National Museum of the Philippines, Journal of Natural History, Philippine Journal of Science, and Zoo Taxa. She has also delivered several talks on merging art with science at numerous confer conferences. 
Being a scientific illustrator, she also led lecture workshops at the National Museum of the Philippines, Lopez Museum and Library, University of Santo Tomas, Pampanga, Pampanga State Agricultural University, and the University of the Philippines, Diliman. She is also the lead artist in the reconstructive painting of Lolong, the world's largest crocodile in captivity, which is now on display at our very own National Museum of Natural History. Let's take a look at Isa Dominga's artworks. So this is the Begonia Meretii. So as you can see, she's very, um, she, she really has to show the scientific parts or the feature of the flower because botanical artworks, they have to be the real uh, image of the art of the species. Let's go to the next artwork. So this is the Alpinia Glabrescens. All of these artworks that we're showing to you now were part of the different exhibitions of the Philippine Botanical Art Society. And this can be found also in our website, the philippineflora.org. And let's go to the third artwork. And this is the Pafeo Pedellum Cellulare. Our fourth artist is Carla Sahona. Carla Sahana's art is a manifestation of her mindful and perceptive nature. Every stroke and every detail is delicately rendered to visualize the beautiful complexity of her flora and fauna paintings. A former visual arts educator, she specializes in mediums like watercolor, acrylic paint, and colored pencils. Her keen fondness for nature through her intricate flora and fauna works has since become her vehicle for educating viewers about its biodiversity significance. So Ms. Carla Sahona and Ms. Isa Domingo are our featured artists for our art workshops on May 5. So we're very interested to see their art demo. Uh, let's take a look at Carla Sahona's artworks. So this is the Banago. When you look at uh, Carla's artworks, you feel the lightness of her hand while painting it. And she used watercolor on this specific artwork. Watercolor is, I think uh, personally, is one of the hardest medium because if you commit a mistake, you will not be able to correct it anymore. And Carla is usually, uh, she always, always used the medium of watercolor in her artworks. Next um, slide, please. And this one is the Bagawak Morado. So look at the details of her painting. Um, it's really there. And uh, I have been uh, exhibiting with Carla since 2018. And um, in, actual, in, uh, in actual paintings, you will see really the details of the different aspects of the species. So next uh, slide, please. And this is the Casopangil. Okay. Mr. Jose Valerio, um, or the late Danilo Emburagay, known as Jose Valerio, learned how to draw by copying the funny character characters from the American comic books he will get for free from Lawrence Station, American Navy base in Catanduanes, where he used to live as a young boy. He is an artist who is fond, fond of realism and his works show masterful realistic renditions of Philippine flora and fauna. He finds ultimate pleasure from painting, especially when he finishes an artwork that he rendered in full detail. Okay, let's see the artworks of Sir Jose. So this is the Songelo Don Juan Gonzalesi. Juan Gonzalesi. It was named after Sir JC, one of the former curators of UPLB Museum of Natural History. Second slide, please. And this is the famous Medanilia Magnifica. Sir um, um, Joey or Sir Jose Valerio, when he was still alive, he will be posting his paintings on different um, uh, social accounts of Facebook. And he will also upload it on YouTube and he teaches for free. I had the chance of 
um, having a lesson from him via a video call, but we're very sad that he passed away due to COVID last year. Last um, artwork. Is that the last one, chat? Oh, anyway, I guess because um, when I was sending the email to chat, my Wi-Fi is really slow. But then even without the pictures, I will mention our last um, artist. He is Larry Janko, and he was exposed to arts even when he was a child. He grew up and was schooled at Angono, where love for the arts is very alive. He pursued biology in college at the Polytechnic University of the Philippines because of his love for animals and nature. Currently, he is a museum staff at the National Museum of the Philippines, working under the zoology division. It exposed him to the beauty of Philippine native and endemic flora and fauna. Okay, so there, I hope that you had a great time viewing this beautiful botanical artworks painted by some of the best botanical artists of Felbas. The Philippine Botanical Arts Society has been raising awareness about the critical conservation status of our Philippine flora through its exhibitions, lectures, and art workshops because utilizing visual art as a platform to raise conservation awareness is effective. It inspires people to be engaged in environmental problems and allows them to think of potential solutions to these issues. Depicting the Philippine native flora through visual arts gives us unlimited access to its beauty and importance. To those who are interested to join Philbas, kindly visit our official Facebook page and website. Philbas is open to anyone, even non-artists. If you have a passion to advocate for our native flora, we are very excited to welcome you. Before I end my talk, on behalf of the FAURA Project, the University of the Philippines, Manila, and the Philippine Botanical Art Society, I would like to invite you to join us on May 5, 2022 at five o'clock in the afternoon at the Artist Space Gallery at Unimart Capital Commons, Pasig City for the opening of the Botanical Art Exhibition celebrating native flora in the time of the pandemic. Thank you very much for your attention and for this opportunity to share with you the advocacy of Philbas and the beautiful botanical artworks of our members. Muli po, magandang umaga sa inyong lahat. Ang lahat ng ito ay para sa kalikasan. All right. Thank you very much, Miss Bing, for um for that very inspiring and uh wonderful presentation about Phil Bass. So first, uh, uh, I'd like to thank you again for introducing to us the inspiring advocacies and activities of Phil Bass. It's it's very evident how uh, uh Miss Bing's and uh the Phil Bass artists' works are not only masterpieces. No, and works of art, but also sources of rich information and awareness on our endemic flora in the Philippines. It's really interesting that some of the works highlight uh, not only the, the physical features or um, the phys physical features of these flowers, but also the scientific deconstruction uh, of the flower's parts, as some of the artists would illustrate. You really get to learn wa, uh, while you're enjoying the view of, of, of these paintings, you get to learn a lot about uh, the inner workings of these flowers. Um, they really inspire us to use art to promote and enrich our very rich uh, biodiversity here in the Philippines. So um, there, again, if you have uh, questions about Miss Bing's presentation, just hold on to them until uh, the Q&A portion later. I myself have um, a few questions for Miss Bing, but of course, um, if you have your questions, uh, we you guys will go first later. So again, thank you, Miss Bing. Now, I will be introducing our uh, next speaker. All right, our next speaker is Professor Ten at the University of the Philippines, Manila. Uh, she received her PhD in Philippine Studies from the University of the Philippines, Diliman, and specializes in mythology and literature and dance as healing art. 
So here with us to present ang tema at imahen ng mga bulaklak sa mga alamat ng kamay nilaan at paligid is Dr. Grace Odal Devora. Grace, good morning po. Oh, good, good morning to all of you. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Uh, okay. Uh, can you help me with the flashing of my PowerPoint? So while they are, are working on it there, uh, I just came from my trip to Cebu. Uh, so I can just have a follow-up of the images. I'm ha having a hard time getting them and making sure uh, that they're correct. So <laughs> I will just uh, follow them up. Uh, maybe later in the edited portion of this paper. So, if you have, di ba, meron tayong uh, uh, libro, Flores de, uh, Flores de Manila, pero I can also say na we can also have Flores de Manila in terms of a book of legends of Manila. Uh, so, uh, yes, can you hear me? So, I will, can you, can you just flash this? Uh, wait, let me see. Can you just flash this? I cannot do it part by part. The first one. The next slide, please. Okay. Through uh through description, uh, I will just uh have there's there are too many myths and legends about flowers in Manila. So what can you do in 15 to 20 minutes? So I just what I try to do is just to focus on one that I find very significant. So through identification, description, and narration of the various derived themes of, of narratives pertaining to flowers, plants, and trees in Manila and its surroundings. What is this? An analysis and reflection on the dominant images and themes of the flowers will be examined on their cultural, historical, and social context. And their implica the implications on their significance will be analyzed and evaluated from the perspective of people empowerment and social development. So the focus of this study will be the story called Why Flowers Bloom and May. This, uh, uh, this story actually is... Uh, based on an interview of, of the former professor Alfonso Santos of the Department of English because before I went into analysis uh, into the collection of myths and legends of course he was my predecessor in the early 70s he was already collecting stories and this was taken from someone from Manila uh, I will give the uh, full name later so if the, the story talks about uh, Wait, before that story, this story actually has uh, this uh, lecture has or attempts to and to touch on these issues, but not to answer them yet. Or the pre-colonial, the pre-colonial possibility of the Flores de Mayo. Second is uh, the predominance of the theme of forbidden love. There's always in most of the stories there there is this idea of forbidden love, and. Third, uh, there is uh, the the attempt to really understand what the flower of Manila is. What is that flower? No, are, are they referring to a single flower, or are they, uh, or they're focusing on the flower or the the leaves or whatever? So I'm uh, I, I was consciously did that, and then of course, okay, let me let me let me now focus on the story. Bakit mabulaklak ang buwan ng Mayo? That was just put on there because the story did not have a title, of course, but that is the gist, no? And apparently, it seems to be pre-colonial because if I read the story, uh, here it is. Here is the Tagalog version. There is, uh, you can see the, the main, uh, the main uh, uh, images there or uh, features. Ugali na ni Dana ang maligo sa malamig na tubig ng Ilog Pasig tuwing magbubukang liwayway. Umaawit-awit pa siya kung kinukuskus ang kanyang katawan ng pinipit na balat ng kahoy na noong panahong iyon ay ginagamit na gugo. Kung siya'y umahon ay lumilitaw na ang haring araw sa tuktok ng kabundukan, uupo siya sa pangpang ng ilog at aayusin niya ang suklay na gawa sa sungay sa kalabaw ang kanyang mahaba at maitim na buhok. Tutuhog-tuhugin niya ang mapuputit, mababangong bulaklak ng sampagita at ipapalamutin niya sa kanyang ulo at liig ang kwintas na bulaklak. Naging panata 
Panatana ni Ridana ang pag-aalay ng sariwang bulaklak sa isang malapad na batong buhay na kanilang pinag-uukulan ng panalangin kay Bathala. Yaon ay isang ugaling minana pa niya sa ninuno ni Maginoo ang mahalikang ama ni Dana. Kaya lahat ng masasakupan ni Maginoo ay nagbibigay galang sa malapad na batong, batong itong tuwing napaparaan sa dakong yaon. Alam niyo na yung kaya tinawag yung barangay ba, malapad na bato dati yung lugar na ito. Maraming halaman ng alaga si Dana sa tabi ng ilog. Dinidilig-dilig niya ang mga ito upang maging mabulaklak. Sa araw-araw ay hindi nawawala si Dana ng bulaklak na pangalay sa banal na bato. Sa kanyang paghahalaman ay malimit mamasdan ng makapangyarihang aring-haring araw si Dana. Nabihag na ang haring araw sa kagandahan ni Dana. Nais niyang makasama si Dana sa kanyang paglilibot sa mundo sa maghapon. Ngunit si haring araw ay di ta, iba ay di taong katulad ni Dana. Wala siyang bibig na maari magpahayag ng kanyang pag-ibig kay Dana. Si Dana na may walang kamalay-malay sa lihim na pagsinta ni haring araw. Lagi pa siyang Minamasdan ng walang tigil sa paglalakbay sa buong maghapon. Hindi siya natatakot sa matinding init ng araw. So, portion lang yon ng kwento na yon. So, pero bini, dinadalaw siya nung haring araw na to na hindi niya alam. So, habang naka, natutulog siya, nag-aabang kasi siya nung pagbaba ng araw. So, tagabantay siya ng pagsikat ng araw at pagbaba ng araw at ito ay kanyang Mm, panata na. So isang isang magdadapit hapon na ang nakatulog siya at bago bubaba ang araw ay gusto siyang itaas dalhin ni Haring Araw pero dahil naman uh, paano naman daw naisip niya paano niya mapar siya mabubuhay iba ang kanilang mundo. So iniwan na lang niya. Kaya lang pagkaroon ng ilang buwan ay lumaki ng lumaki ang kanyang tiyan. So <laughs> naskandalo ang kanyang Uh, datong ama at sinasabi sino pinapangalagaan kita sino ang iyo ang nagsamantala sa iyo sabi naman niya wala po wala pong kala- akong kilala wala akong kasintahan <laughs> e eh, bakit ka ganyan so nagtatalo sila hanggang sa akala nila siya ay nagsisinungaling pero hindi niya talaga alam bakit siya nabuntis yan pagkatapos pinalayo siya ng kanyang ama at doon niya naisinilang sa sa ka- sa pampang ng ilog na noon ay masukal pa. Ay, wala pa um, pre-colonial days pa to. So ma, yung panahon na yun na hindi pa ganito ang itsura ng ilog Pasig. So doon siya nag uh, nagluwal na tinawag yan ng babaeng si Bituin. Bituin pero tinulungan din siya ng mahiwagang kapangyarihan ng kanyang tagapag-ibig. Kaya anyway, nagsisi yung kanyang ama at uh, tinag Tinanggap na ang kanyang sinabi at dahilan. Kaya buwan ng Mayo nang muling magbalik si Dana sa kanilang bayan. Namulaklak na muli. So nung habang wala siya, namatay ang kanyang mga alaga. Kasi parang kaisa niya yung mga alaga niyong bulaklak. Namulaklak na muli ang mga halaman sa tabing ilog. Ang mga damo ay nanariwang muli. Pumahalimuyak ang bangon ng Sampagita. Sumigla rin naman ang kababayan ni Dana. Nagpa, nagpapista si Maginoo, nagdiwang ang sambayan sa pagbabalik ni Nadana, Dalaga at Maginoo. Yung Dalaga si Bituin din yun, no? At uh, uh, yung Maginoo, yung kanyang ama, nagpasalamat sila kay Bathala. At sa gayon muli, nawang, na rin, uh, ang buwan ng Mayo ay buwan ng Bulaklak. At sa panahon ng mga Kastila ay naging alay sa mahal na birhen. So lumalabas sa kwento na to uh, na... Uh, merong meron tayong biwata ng bulaklak at merong tagapag-alay ng bulaklak na parang isang babaylan na gising na siya bago pa magbulak at naliligo siya yung tema ng paliligo ng isang babae sa sinag ng araw at pag-aalay ng bulaklak ay isang lumang Uh, parang tradisyon, mayroong mga tema ako nakitang ganyan. So, sa context niya, meron namang katatayong malapad na bato, barangay malapad na bato. Uh, maraming mga kwento dito at natatagpuan siya sa May Guadalupe. Uh, binabanggit ng Serizal ang malapad na bato bilang isang holy place. Tapos may cave malapit doon, the cave of Doña Jerome, Jeronima. 
uh, merong reference sa Haring Araw na parang may re- merong reference sa isang ancient sun cult or reverence. Uh, makikita nyo rin na ang pang- pa- Panginoon ng mga pinuno ng Pandakan noon uh, uh, o Santa Ana ay si Lady Buwan at si Haring Araw. Ba't nagkaganito? At uh, yung idea ng taking a bath facing the sun Uh, tapos ang holy confluence, bakit nagkaganito ito na? Anyway, uh, ng holy conflu- confluence ang uh, Marikina River, Bangbang River at Napan- Napindan River, yun na yun, may confluence. Ngayon ay, ano na ba yun? Parang may isang station doon, floodway station. Na uh, ang sabi ng iba, may malapat na ba ito, malapat na ba ito yung area na yun? Kaya lang tinayo na yung... Um, floodway station sa gitna ng tatlong ilog pa uh, ateros tapos yung isa papuntang napindan isa papuntang yung Bambang River na continuation ng Pasig River so the next please the next so uh, may context din ng may mga flower offerings talaga sa isang banal na rock of batala na merong historical reference niya na isang si, si Chirino eh so Uh, mayroong idea din ng Sacred Union of Sun, Moon, and Star kasi yung Haring Araw, tapos yung usually yung babaeng ang buwan, tapos bituin yung mga anak uh, dito dalaga. The dedication of May to Flowers. So, okay. so para tayong mayroong Greek counterpart, <laughs> Greek ca- counterpart dito na mayroong diwata, parang si ang nagsisilbing diwata ng mga bulaklak dito ay si ay ay yung si Dana. Okay, next please. Ah, uh, so ito pala yung uh, sinasabi ko sa iyo. I will I will do it. Uh, drawing ng isang ng isang informant dito kung saan yung malapad na bato, tapos ano yung kweba. I will just uh, fix that later. So, ito yung next sa uh, pre-colonial connection to sun. May pagka element, uh, may element ito ng pre-colonial sun offering. Okay, na may con- con- connected with the rock, with the malapad na bato, uh, offered to the flowers. And now let's go, let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, may mga archetypal symbols ito na yung sinasabi nilang batala sa kwento ay in reference to the rock. Pero meron din naman ngayon na sinasabing mga buwayang bato. So, uh, maraming kwento tungkol sa buwayang bato. And then, yung kwento rin ng Uh, yung anyway may magsing magising irog uh, na isang banyaga at uh, isang Pilipina na magsing irog kundi nag na, na nakakita ng isang mahiwagang bulaklak ang babae dinuk ang uh, inabot niya yung pero gumiwang ang kanilang bangka nahulog sa bangka ang babae dahil sa bulaklak na mahiwagang bulaklak na inaabot niya at nahulog silang dalawa na matay sila and that is the story of the lost uh, the lost lovers uh, being one with the lost flowers no anyway next please mamaya itatayin ko sila lahat yan ito yung historical link na binabanggit ni uh, Father Chirino tungkol sa sa mga stones no what more did they adore the very stones 1604 ito, cliffs and reefs, the headlands of the shores of the sea or the rivers. And they, ipapalilabas ko to para makita ko. And they, and, and placing the offer, okay. When they pass by, they made some offerings when they pass by this, going to the stone or rock and placing the offering upon it. I saw many times in the river of Manila a rock with for so, which for so many years was an idol. So, to say, hempse, sa tingin niya ng mga Kastila, idol yan, of that wretched people. This scandal which occasioned great evils lasted until the fathers of St. Augustine, who dwell nearby with holy zeal, broke to, broke it to pieces and erected in its, in its place a cross. So, gano'n nila <laughs> nawala. Uh, uh, parang napatay ang isang kwento. Uh, from the demonized rock. Uh, malapad na bato. Okay, so next link please. Uh, the offering passes. It was ito yung isang isang rendition sa Tagalog naman. Uh, sa English naman. It was a beautiful it was the beautiful Dana's custom to bathe daily at dawn in the waters of the Pasig as she rubbed her ta- 
her light, shapely body with crushed, sweet-smelling bark, her lively silver voice could be heard warbling a dulcet melody. Parang ito yung mucha ng pasig na kumakanta. No? Parang gano'n na umaawit. The theme of the, the singing lady, she would emerge from her bath at the moment of the sun's uh, crimson rays beginning to appear upon the summit of the distant mountains. After running ito, Dana would proceed to gather a, hand, a handful of fragrant and exquisite flowers growing on the river bank and then gather them into a garland which she wore around her head and neck and then she would offer it to the next slide please next slide please wala na bang <laughs> nasa na yung next slide niya to close to where the flowers grew lay a huge bato batong buhay live stone or living stone which had been consecrated to Bathala the supreme deity in accordance with a long established practice of the village Dana always laid fresh flowers on the stone as an offering to the mightiest of the gods so ito ito nandito na yung um, exact name nung reference na to by Professor Alfonso Santos sa kanyang compilation Romance in Philippines Philippine Names okay next uh, fl- please so makikita nyo there is, there is a pre-colonial and colonial links kasi uh, meron pa kasi isang uh, ano yung flower as pearl no? kasi ito kinuha ko to na, nasa volume to ng 1946 sa klase ni Dr. Arsenio Manuel 1946 pa to Uh, I'm just quoting this, no? From my paho kalookan. It's about the flower as the uh, pearl. Ang amihan ay may simoy na napakalamig. Gayon man kapag hinangad diyang mapaimbulog ang anumang bagay sa papawirin, ay nalalaro niya ito ng parang walang anuman. Kaya't nang minsang map managhili ang amihan sa isang maluwang at magarang halamanan ay isang bulaklak ang napigtal sa tangkay at marahang napaimbulog ng amihan ang natura naturang bulaklak sa himpapawid hanggang sa duma hanggang sa dumating sa gitna ng dagata dagatang lubhang napakalalim Pagsabit sa dagat na natu- naturan ay biglang binitawan ng amihan ang dalang bulaklak hanggang sa ito'y nalaglag sa tubig at laruin ang kanyang mumunting alon. Nang ito'y mamalas na mga kabibi na nakahimlay sa puso ng dagat ay walang atubiling nagbuka ng kanilang mga talukab at ang lumulubog na bulaklak ay dahan-dahang sinalo at pinagyaman sa kanilang mga talukab. Mula noon, ang kabibay nagkaperlas na marikit na ang naging himlayan ay pusod ng karagatan at ang mga perlas na ito ay naging hiyas at napabantog, napabantog sa kapuluan hanggang sa iba't ibang panig ng daigdig. 1946 ni Kwento ni Ernesta Lopez ng May Pahobulacan. No? Um, uh, very very poetic ang pagkakwento. Ayawang ko kung tula ito. No? So, pero dito nakita na ang ang perlas ay nagmula sa bulaklak na pinigtal ng hangin no pero so dito naman sa when the flowers uh, meron ding nawala ang mga bulaklak kasi kung napakinggan niyo siguro yung lecture ni Bing tungkol sa bulaklak di ba nang bakit tinawag yung kiapo so marami actually hindi ko napakinggan yung lecture niya uh, pero dun sa lecture sa dun sa when the lilies return nawala ang mga bulaklak ang ah, mga lilies na tinawag yung bulaklak ng bulaklak ay yung para nagre-refer sa lilies white lilies na namatay lahat dahil sa digmaan di ba so yung magwaya naman si magayong lady nagulat na ako bakit andito si magwaya ikwento to ng Pasig River pero ah, pa kwento to ng uh, Luzon sa Katagalugan eh si magwaya kasi ano goddess of the sea sa kabisayaan pero pero hanggang dito siguro nakarating siya kasi tagalog yung sources nitong information na to magwayen nung umula ng uh, umula ng mga mga precious stones sa Pasig sa Manila uh, sa Manila Bay pero si Magwayen ay na-attract pala nung panahon na yon sa mga sa hangin na nagmumula sa kalupaan na ang malabulaklak ang apo ang amoy 
malabulaklak, gano'n. So, si Jose Rizal, sa tabi uh, ng... Excuse me, Ma'am Grace. Uh, sorry to interrupt po. Uh, you've used uh, 20 minutes po. Siguro ah, okay. may... Uh, we, so, ito we na. Have next so, ito minutes. na yung application. So, tabi ng Pasig, nagre-refer si Jose Rizal sa Bulaklak then Flores de Mayo. Nagtapos, nagkapunta na tayo sa Flores de Mayo. Ito na yung... Uh, colonial flower offering by guys ang Pedro de Makati may sayo sila sa face of our lady of the rose pink o sige next uh, yan na yung conclusion na yan next is susunod dito babasahin ko na lang so the dance and the song of the lady lampas na yan kasi yan na yung description lang ng song na so quoted from my interview okay meron daw ba ma, din dito may uh, may sinasabi na ang habang wala na yung kiapo mawala ang kalayaan at happiness ng Filipinos. Dito, sa kaya po kasi happiness ang mawala. Dito, kalayaan. Next. And uh, mayroon na siyang quotation. Overall generalization, symbolically, the flower is the pearl of our being as an individual and as a nation waiting for the manifestation of our loss of sense of oneness with the light and our divinity based on authentic freedom emerging from our inner law of our being. So, the flower here symbolizes the fruit of our self, the highest self. The mucha self manifesting, waiting for our spiritual birth, some kind of a cultural renaissance, uh, with our inang baya as our, our inang bayan as a symbol of the flower lady. Next, meron pa yata conclusion. The story of Dana arising at daybreak to offer upon the whole re- as a living rock is symbolic of the long-awaited and hoped-for birth or rebirth or manifestation of our authentic and full and the new demonstration of our full potentials as a people of oneness, a unity in diversity. The Inang Bayan is our true self and the flower is the image of our pearl of divinity within and our Rosa Malaya, which is the title of one of the... Of the Uh, the stories I could have I could have uh, shared to you but for lack of time ganun lang I just concentrated on one thank you All right. thank you very much Mom Grace um, uh, for enlightening us on the relevance of flowers not only in our environment but also in local folklore just like what I said earlier Philippine culture has been very influenced by nature Um, through the uh, the his, uh, through the story we heard from Mom Grace, we can see that even in our folk literature, natural elements have been influential to major events in people's lives. Uh, in a way, we can see that the flower has uh, has been used to to symbol to symbolize uh, the femininity of our uh, of our um, of our main character. Uh, she, uh, we, she was able to uh, we, the the story was able to to represent uh, her as a flower uh, in in a way. Uh, we even use uh, we even use these elements, particularly flowers, as offerings to the divine. Uh, it's very interesting. Um, so, but first, I would like to uh, thank our speakers for their very educational and engaging talks. Uh, But meanwhile, the floor is now open for questions. Feel free to send in your questions through the Zoom chat. This is our Q&A portion. I hope you have some, quest- uh, some questions ready for our, uh, for our speakers because they are very much ready to, to answer your questions. However, um, I think Ms. Zuri uh, Sha. Uh, Miss Zurin Shari is not here with us because she's celebrating Eid al-Fitr. So yeah, she got caught up in the celebration so, so she won't be able to answer your questions today. But I think uh, you can you, you, you can still send in your questions uh, to us maybe and then we can just ask or, or send your questions to Miss Shari. But we have Miss Bing Famoso Takan and Dr. Grace Odaldivora here to answer your questions. Uh, maybe to keep the to keep the ball rolling or just to start, no? Baka you guys are uh, are are shy or you, you you need a little nudge to um to formulate your questions. Maybe maybe I can go first. Okay. Uh, my first question is uh for Miss Bing. Um, hi, Ms. Yes, Bing. ma'am. Hello, po. I will not turn on turn on my video anymore. Okay. <laughs> okay, po. Um, well, I'm really curious because actually, my first question earlier was, 
uh, if if you're op- uh, how how our participants or even uh, everyone who will be watching uh, this uh, this conference video to uh, to to know how we how we can apply for uh, for membership. But you you already covered that earlier, so I'm really happy to know that. But now my question will be: Will Phil Bass be uh, venturing into other art forms? Uh, apart from from painting like music, performing arts, uh, or like Mom Grace's presentation, literature, maybe for poetry and prose. Uh, I don't know. I, I really want to know if if Phil Bass will not, because uh, c- I noticed that the exhibits that Phil Bass uh, mounts uh, are all uh, paintings and they're really wonderful. And I think the, the members are also visual artists but I, I would like to know if you will be open to to uh, venturing to other art forms as well oh, yeah that's a very nice question Miss Rosie but then of course uh, the main um, uh, art f- art form that we are promoting is botanical art so actually those different activities can be uh, I think um, Uh, if ever we have exhibits or activities, we can, you know, just consolidate all these activities. No, we can't, ano kasi yung music. Siguro pag may mga isang malaking event, like we're planning to have, uh, kasi uh, Philippine Botanical Art Society, is, is its inception was in only in 2019. And uh, we are still, you know, moving forward, but then pandemic came. So we still don't have an exec- executive committee. And then uh, we just... Uh, Uh, relying on volunteers but then those um, ideas are okay but right now our main focus is on botanical art uh, but then sh- syempre, there are also other graphic artists who are asking us if they can also like uh, submit um, digitally um, painted na artworks um, to go to in the future we will um, be open to those kinds of activities po. Thank you very much, Miss Bing. Uh, actually, uh, you also you also mentioned no, the the what's that? A uh, graphic design. Because I was thinking maybe um, uh, a lot of your artists are focusing on traditional art or traditional painting. But since you mentioned uh, graphic design or graphic art, uh, or yeah, graphic. Uh, visual painting, art painting yes mm-hmm. yeah graphic painting yes i guess uh that's uh, that's good. yeah but we are open also they can also submit their graphic artworks to our facebook pages uh and then we also encourage them to do like um sculpture but at this point uh we are still just promoting botanical art <laughs> and then uh like, like uh we can uh one weekend ago we had our first three walk And then we also had an on-the-spot painting in Tai Tai Rizal. So I think that's another activity that will be very promising for Philpas members. Mm-hmm. All right. Thank you very much, Miss Bing, for for answering that question. And um, well, I was really in um I was really in awe of of Phil Bass's um advocacy because uh well I I've been. Uh, aware of it before because you have been a very active um, a member of uh, of Faura Project, but uh, there I really learned a lot, bebe. Um, okay, uh, thank you, Miss Bing, for that uh, for that uh, for your answer. Now You're I have uh, okay, thank you. Um, uh, I have a question in the chat. Uh, the chat box um, for Mom Grace. Hi, Mom Grace. I I I hope you're still yes. here. Yes, yes. Um, uh, our question from Jess is: Can she recommend books where the stories she shared can be accessed? Uh, some of these are found in the usual books that you can buy from National, but mm-hmm. unfortunately, they don't indicate. Their sources, yun ang problema. <laughs> parang, parang hindi academic base. So, uh, kasi iba halung katin mo talaga sa mga manuscripts. Pero, for instance, what I mentioned about the romance in Philippine names, that's a, that's a good book. I mean, because they are, the sources are indicated. They were really interviewed by, uh, that's one, you can start with that. And of course, uh, Professor uh, Damiana Eugenio, 
Uh, she has books, or a series of books on Philippine mythology, myths, legends, epics. I mean, that's scholarly done. May source, mayroon talagang sources of information. Katulad ng ginawa ni, ni Alfonso Santos. Although I can say that yung unang, ang unang gumawa doon si Alfonso Santos. And then nakakuha, and then, nakakuha si Damiana Eugenio. Nag-focus din siya ng ganito ng mga f- funding from UP to publish her collections. Yun. Uh, yun. Uh, but there are many mga dissertations, yung mga ni-research on field. Makikita mo yan, unpublished pa yung karamihan sa kanila. At marong Pasig Papers Collection si Arsenio Manuel na yun ang madalas na ginagamit ko kasi she, uh, student, estudyante siya ni si ba tong, yung field uh, nag-collect ng Philippine Ethnography. Nag-Philippine Ethnography, uh, mga 1916 pa, naging teacher niya yon. Uh, and then ginaya niya sa Pasig Papers Collection from the 1940s after the war, right after the war, until he retired in 1970s. He, he became my teacher and he taught us how to ascertain the traditionality of stories. But you can, they're available, no? may compilation, si ano rin, si F. Landa Hocano, Meron din siyang books about uh, mythology na compilation na scholarly dana, hindi lang basta-basta. Pero yung usual book kayo na story lang, pero walang indication ng sources. Medyo, pwede mong tanungin para maging scholarly. If you're interested in the story, you can ask them where they got the story so that you can evaluate the scholarship involved in getting the stories. Thank you. Sana sinag-nasalit ko. Uh, all right. Thank you, Ma'am Grace. Well, really, no, and uh, and the uh, uh, in the world of academe and in the world of literature, when when these folk um folk stories meet uh well academic papers or academic sources, it's really difficult to um it's really difficult to trace the uh the sources or the authenticity of some of these works so yes we, f- we feel that struggle among grace thank you very much mom grace do you have more questions from the audience all right so um well i think that's it well i hope you you learned a lot from from our uh from our first three speakers And we would like to thank uh, these speakers uh, for their time. Uh, before we proceed with the next segment, we at the FAWER Project would like to show our appreciation to our speakers through these certificates. Allow me to read the citation. Um, maybe flash the certificates for our speakers, please. All right. So, let me just zoom in. Okay, uh, the FAUR Project Incorporated with Philippine Botanical Arts Society and the University of the Philippines, Manila, present the Certificate of Appreciation to Bing Famoso Takan for speaking on floral artists in Phil Bass. Given this third day of May 2022, during the conference plenary on celebrating heroes and heritage, painting and myth advocates during the 2022 International Flores de Mayo Festival and Conference. Signed by Dr. Honey Libertin at Sanzar Labor, the Executive Director of the FAUR Project Incorporated and the convener of the Conference on Celebrating Native Flora in the Time of the Pandemic. Also signed, uh, uh, Professor Alice Adeva, the Chairperson or the Chair of the, the Department of Arts and Communication at CAS UP Manila. So that's for Ms. Bing, Famoso Takan. Uh, and also for uh, uh, or the Certificate of Appreciation to, to Ms. Zuriati Muhammad Shari for speaking on endemic flowers in batik art. Uh, signed by Dr. Uh, Labor also, by uh, Professor uh, Alice Adeva also, and Ms. Wela Famoso Takan. Uh, and last, a uh, certificate of appreciation to uh, Dr. Grace Odaldevora for speaking on ang tema at imahe ng mga bulaklak sa mga alamat ng kamaynilaan at paligid. Signed by um, Dr. Labor, uh, Professor Adeva, and also Ms. Bing. Okay. So, um, 
there. Thank you very much again to our speakers. Um, I'd like to ask first, uh, Ma'am Levy, if uh, we have time for a break or um, should we just go on? Yes, perhaps we uh, we can proceed. Yes, the second section of our panel. Yes. All thank right. You. So thank and you. And congratulations for uh, thank you for moderating this. Well done, and congratulations to our three speakers. All right. Thank you again. Thank you very much to uh, our speakers from our first segment. All right. So um, there now to introduce our next session entitled "Celebrating Heroes and Heritage." Dance Advocates is Dr. Honey Libertin at Sanzar Labor, the conference convener and the director of the FAURA Project Incorporated. Okay, uh, so uh, good morning. Uh, as, as expressed in the session yesterday afternoon, we in the FAURA Project are truly elated that we are celebrating heroes in this year's Flores de Mayo Festival celebrating scientist heroes who have contributed in promoting and conserving native Philippine flowers. We thank them for increasing the number of local flora attributed to the Philippines. So we continue this morning by celebrating heroes in promoting local flowers to the visual arts and written narratives. And in this part of the program, we celebrate heroes who promote flowers through dance. No? So we are most grateful that both our speakers can join us this morning. So to introduce them properly, let me bring you back to Miss Hilario. Thank you. Thank you very much, from Levy, for um, introducing us to our next session or to our next segment. It's very exciting as well. Um, now to introduce our, uh, our first speaker for the second session, um, our speaker is a professor at the Department of Human Kinetics, College of Arts and Sciences at the University of the Philippines, Los Baños. She is also an, an affiliate professor of the Faculty of Education at the University of the Philippines Open University and currently a program chair of the Associate in Arts or AA program. Uh, her researches include community well-being through engagement, fitness and leisure and dance movement analysis of Philippine folk dances. So um, let's now listen to our next speaker, Dr. Merites M. Buot, uh, to present uh, on the flowers among the Philippine dances. Flowers have always played a vital role in maintaining and improving healthy relationships with the loved ones and with the social environment as a whole. Today, I am presenting about the Budaklakan dance. The world has several ways to celebrate special occasions with flowers. To name a few, we have Valentine's Day, Mother's Day, weddings, anniversaries, and birthdays. Most of the time, flowers bring out happy memories. Everyone appreciates receiving flowers, and these would make anybody feel extra special, don't you? The tradition of giving dancers and performers flowers after a performance is a form of audience appreciation. Admirers and fans send and give flowers to symbolize how much you are loved, adored, and idolized. But when did we begin our tradition of giving flowers? Going to our history, the Romans in 27 BC to 476 AD bestowed floral wreaths on their winning athletes. The Chinese also in 618 to 907 CE, the Tang Dynasty specifically, developed a successful form of government which stimulated a cultural and artistic flowering that amounted to the golden age of the use of flowers. During the Victorian age, that was in 1837 to 1901, the giving of flowers was art and language all in itself. Every flower and color was given a meaning. Even the way the flowers were handed to the recipient meant something, as it was a time when showing emotion openly was not socially accepted. And the giving of flowers or a bouquet helped to convey love, gratitude, or friendship in a way that words at the time could not. Could not say anything. 
Now flowers are sights to behold, especially used as props also in our dances. So Bulaklakan, we call this as a parade of flowers, is one of the Philippine folk dance that is being widely performed during the month of early May. This is dedicated to the Virgin Mary during the celebration of the Holy Week of the Roman Catholics. The history of the Bulaklakan started off with three provinces, Nueva Ecija, Bataan, and Bulacan. At present, the Bulaklakan is something that is enjoyed by the locals of the city of Montinlupa and had been celebrated lavishly before the pandemic. This was done with the procession of the patron saint, Mary Mother of God, where Hermanus and Hermanus dress up with different national costumes of the Philippines and abundant display of flowers can be seen. Right, so, in relation to our dance culture, Bulaklakan is a representation of the beliefs that spring, spring is indeed coming, and new hopes with those flowers are in bloom. Right, so, so dance, or the Bulaklakan, is what we call the dance of the flower, floral garlands. So what makes the dance fun? The props, yes. Since it is called the dance of the floral garlands, it would not be complete without the flowers. The dancers hold props made out of garlands of leaves and flowers attached to either wire or bamboo or rattan to create an arch when held overhead. Right, so for the sake, for this paper, for this current paper, looking at the materials and methods, the COVID-19 and its restrictions have changed the lives of people, people from all over the globe. The shift from the traditional mode of face-to-face -face learning to the unfamiliar mode of online and distance learning has indeed changed and impacted the lives of the students in both academic and personal aspects. For students, the sudden shift to the new mode of flexible online and distance learning presented several issues and difficulties. This current paper made use of the module learning and the use of open source materials as the main reference. The students had three weeks to prepare until the output submission. Collaborative work was very necessary. Thematic analysis then was used for the reflection essays uh, from them, from the students. Right, so in every Philippine dance, a saludo or the bows are necessary to begin and end the dance. The saludo is just like a handshake. So if a meeting one is meeting a friend, so they have this handshake and it begins the conversation and usually it also ends with that. was the end the saludo was shown and all the steps in this dance consist of one step you can see that from that video and turns and the famous the flower formation which we could not see because of we cannot show that because of the limited um, space because they are they're still living our students are still living away from each other so in this case we also have yeah there were also the made use of the cross while step. Now we can also show another video. There are garlands and those were made by the students and it was only showing that video was only showing to you that there was a cross wall step and most of the time yeah all of the time they have to hold on to that arch which um, represent the garlands of flowers. Now, for students, the sudden shift to the new mode of flexible online and distance learning, yes, there were issues and challenges. Of course, I'm sure it's not only for students alone, but also was true with all of us. So independent learning is the principle that may help us understand our learners, but due to our class deadlines indeed, there was a need to accomplish the task at hand at a specified dates. So collaborative learning is needed, truly needed skills for this matter. 
Right, so moving on, um, there were three emergent themes from the narratives, from the reflection of the students. So number one emergent theme was time spent together. Although they were not spending the time physically, but they had to come together and set a schedule for their own output to be finished. So they were delighted to see the end product. So one was, or most of them were telling us, personally preparing the material was quite challenging as they had to buy plastic flowers and hula hoop, spend hours attaching each flower, leaf, and arrange them in such a way that it would look attractive and presentable. After completing the props, I was delighted to see the result and I was excited to use it for the activity. Moreover, I am grateful to my group mates for doing their best, most especially to Mitch. So there was also this um, appreciation to one of their group mates. Overall, I am glad to have the opportunity to perform Bulaklakan, albeit the online setup. So there was an expression of delight and the concerns of the challenges. Yes, so moving to emergent theme number two, planning was necessary. Indeed, it was very necessary for them to have a timeline. So Justin was mentioning an, a one or, and two or three of the students were expressing that communication to recreate and synchronize our steps and motion as taking individual videos of our dances did not assure that the final edit and picture would reflect what we planned. Yeah, um, indeed, there was a need for uh, one or two within the group to know um, most of all the, the skills in video editing, but they had this challenge, the, the issue of having um, time lapses and other, other things they have to consider. But despite these difficulties, we were able to enjoy and create easier ways for us to recreate Bulaklakan. I look forward to chance, the chances to do to dance again in a face-to-face -face setup with a bigger group. One of them mentioned that. So it was the drawback of individual performances when you put all in one video. That's right, because somehow the expected outcome may not come. So even if you go um, sway to the right, everybody will start at the right, but then somehow there's a lag in time due to somehow the internet connection and other things that they have to consider. Now moving on to the emergent theme number three, loving the chance to dance again. So all of them share the same feeling of the long absence from the floor, from the dance floor. So like Jen, um, there was a share that it was my first time after six years to dance again. Although it was not Jen's, um, it was not only Jen was uh, expressing that. So it was um, the Bulaklakan, the first time for her to dance. And the dance requires good hand and feet coordination, especially that there are props while dancing. So in, in a way, having the props um, made or added to the challenge too. So Jen was mentioned that in our group, we only performed simple choreography to make our performance clean because there was this amount of um, target that more or less the movements would be very clear and would be somehow showing the unity within the group. So in order to synchronize our steps well because of the setup. Yeah, it was really the setup. The dance is easy yet intricately dainty, Mary was expressing. Thanks to the flower prop used in the duration of the dance, I find myself, she mentioned, I find myself feeling like a flower girl during Santa Cruz. And considering that, the dance is in honor of the Virgin Mary. So enjoy the dance and it was like going down the memory lane again for some. So they were enjoying that, of course, um, they know for a fact that they had we had several things to consider. All right, so now we'll be looking into um, a segment of the dance that I have um, chosen for, for this presentation. And let's look at it. And you will you also notice that even if they've tried to make us very clean, but when we started, when they had the, the editing, we really could see the difference from what we hope to have. So let me show you this one.
was was quite um, a big challenge to all of them. So if you have seen five five persons in in one video, that would mean five different houses, so five different setups, and then they were able to come up with putting it into one video. And of course, we have one editor who helped us did that. So Flores de Mayo will be with us. Okay, so Flores de Mayo is a, a festive event and without the flowers, it might not be a successful event at all. So even with a pandemic amongst us, but we can be assured of the fact that our faith will still remain with us. Faith that somehow we will be surviving and we are really surviving and Flores de Mayo should be a way of us to thank thank also um, the, the event that surrounds us. Thanks the persons or those persons who have helped us survive. Right? So before I end, I would like to acknowledge our UPLB Philippine Folk Dance students. I have Jennifer, um, Justin, Chantel, uh, Maria Nympha, Marvi. I also have Michaela, Jericho, Clark, Given, Rika, Christina, Charlene, Michaela, Joyce Ann, Neil Rose, and I also have a special participation from Enrico Theria from UPOU. Yes, so thank you so much, and I hope you enjoyed somehow um, a very small clips to dances. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Buot, for educating us about the history of flowers first in relation to dance in general, then eventually you know, more uh, specifically to our very own traditional dance. It's also great that this performing art is being taught to the youth as well, so our traditions do not die. Even during the pandemic, Dr. Buot strives to continue training these students. The young students are given the opportunity to appreciate our own arts and culture. So it's very interesting. Uh, uh, I hope you have your questions ready for later. Dr. Boat is here to answer your questions if you have some. All right, but hold on to those questions because we will be moving on to our next uh, speaker first. Okay, our next speaker is Professor Five at the Central Bicol State University of Agriculture. She obtained her PhD in Educational Foundations at the Bicol University, Legazpi City in 2022. Her Master of Science degree in Physical Education, majoring in dance at the University of the Philippines, Diliman, Quezon City in 2005, and her Bachelor of Secondary Education, majoring in uh, Physical Education, Health, and Music at the University of Nueva Caceres, Naga City in 1997. Her research interests include uh, culture and the arts and physical education. Now, let's all listen to Dr. G.A. Margate of the Central Bicol State University of Agriculture. She will be talking about exploring the motif of flowers in four Bicolano traditional dances. Good day! I am Professor J.A. Margate of Central Bicol State University of Agriculture. My presentation for today is entitled Exploring the Motif of Flowers in Four Bicolano Traditional Dances. Flowering plants are quite literally a source of life. They are also present in mythologies, folklore, and art forms, all of which have led to establishing expressions through flowers for nearly every sentiment. In many cultures, flowers are used in rituals and adorn important icons. These are also used as a means to praise and celebrate significant images because flowers create pleasant and aesthetic value for worship during rituals. For Christians, flowers have been used on several important occasions and holy days since the 4th century. In dance and other performing arts, 
crops have always been relevant and flowers are one of the most commonly used crops in many performances. Crops are a tool that enhances the environmental atmosphere of the whole stage or performance area. In the Philippines, flowers are offered to the Blessed Virgin Mary during the Flores de Mayo or Flowers of May. Flores de Mayo is also celebrated through prayers, procession, songs, and others involved dances. Flowers also form part of the Santa Cruzan as adornment and offers. Santa Cruzan is the reenactment of the finding of the Holy Cross by Empress Elena and her entourage. In many versions of the Santa Cruzan festival, one of the most popular is the parade of queens represented by the town's loveliest ladies walking on the parks that are decorated with flowers. There are folk dances that are popular in our mainstream culture that use flowers as props. One is the bulaklakan, where dancers manipulate arches adorned with different varieties of flowers and leaves. Second is karatong, a folk dance from Palawan where performers hold a giant bunga manga or mango blossom during a festival that celebrates the blooming mango flowers. The third is Putungan, a welcome dance from the province of Marinduque, where visitors and dignitaries are given flower wreaths placed on the head and or garlands worn around the neck. These dances have been visible on stage over the years, which recognizes the importance of our local flora during rituals and celebrations. On the countryside, we also have traditional dances that use flowers as props. This presentation highlights the traditional performing arts in Bicol region with flower motifs. These are the dances that survived through the centuries and became a part of the culture and tradition of the Bicolano. First is Panhardin. This is a form of exaltation to the Holy Cross. The part called Panhardin sa Mahal na Santa Cruz can be found on the last portion of the Novena to the Holy Cross. It is intended to be recited or sung by the devotees, but for the people of Kanakman, this exaltation to the Holy Cross comes with dance. In San Francisco, Kanakman, Camarina Sur, a group of women used to perform this several decades ago. Its performance took place in a makeshift garden and was a prelude to a more popular performance for the Holy Cross called Lagay Light. The storyline of Panhardin begins when a group of women, referred to as the Sita, while searching for the Holy Cross, came across a garden of flowers maintained by two hardineras or female gardeners. The visita manifested their intention to enter the garden. After a long plea, the hardineras eventually welcomed them into the garden and they all helped nurture the flowering plants. Nurturing involves dancing, singing, and watering. After nurturing the plants, they pick the flowers and offer them to the Holy Cross. This picture was taken during its first performance after being done for more than half a century. This is the basic formation of Panhardin. Each performer has her own bunch of flowers to take care of. Uh, these are stuck in several banana trunks. And there's a bigger bunch of flowers at the center, also stuck in a bigger banana trunk. The highlights of the performance are 
nurturing of flowers by singing and dancing around them. The movements particular to the dance are waltz step, slow step, change step, and point step. Another is the watering of flower plants called pagbubo in the local language. Here, the performers take turns in watering the plants while doing a series of waltz steps. Last is the picking of flowers and offering them to the Holy Cross. It is called Pagdulot ng Palma in the local term. These are the flowers in Panhardin. As mentioned in the lyrics, the flowers nurtured by the performers in the garden are lirio or lily, sampaga or jasmine, asusena or tuberose, bukinggan or globe amaras, and rosa or rose. This is the sample stanza in the lyrics. Kami man nga ni Magutol has min na urog tagayon sa samuyang dadarahon sa Santa Cruz nga ni Magayon. The next dance is Lagaylay. It is a two-hour song and dance performance to honor the Holy Cross. It is performed by girls or teens aged 8 to 19. This is performed for nine consecutive nights from May 3 to 11. The performers portray different characters such as Reina Elena, Responde, a pair of spokeswomen standing in front of the line. Uh, Paraduya, the smallest girl, is standing on the right and left side of Elena. And the panamparag or the chorus, which compose most of the paralagay line. All panamparan offer flowers to the Holy Cross on the dansa, the last part of Lagay Lai. Each pair has a specific kind of flower assigned to them, as mentioned in the lyrics. These are the pictures of the panamparan or the chorus offering flowers to the Holy Cross. At present, they utilize paper or plastic flower bouquets for practical reasons. But for nine consecutive nights, they toss fresh flower petals to the Holy Cross at the end of the Pagdulot Ling Palma part. Each pair has a specific variety of flower bouquets assigned to them as offering to the Holy Cross. These are the sample lyrics during uh, sample stands up during the Pagdulot Ling Palma part. The third one reads, An mahamot na burap na bagong mamukad sa tung ipagsabwag sa Cruz na mapalan. According to experts, a newly blossomed flower has a state or time of beauty, freshness, and vigor, an opening to higher perfection, analogous to that of buds into blossoms. The performers usually put flower head pieces to match their outfits. This is called a sahar, which literally translates to orange blossom. In Lagaylay, the term is used to refer to a flower head piece. Actually, when someone has a flower head piece on a normal day, people would comment, Garo para Lagaylay. One is being compared to a Lagaylay performer. In our local context, putting flowers on one's hair is associated with being a para Lagaylay. These are some of the flowers mentioned in the lyrics of Lagaylay, which performers offer to the Holy Cross as a symbol of their exaltation to this most revered Catholic symbol in our country. This is the sample stanza. Sa tuyang idolot, clavel na mahabot, pati ining lirio, sa cruz na santo. There are other stanzas which uh, that pertain to Asmin and Asusena. These are the other varieties of flowers offered to the Holy Cross based on the lyrics. The another dance is Dotok. Dotok is a devotion to the Holy Cross, according to Professor Jasmine Liana. Communities of devotees in the Bicol region perform the Dotok for nine days every year in April and May. It is performed by women cantors called Paradotok, 
who sing a text while playing the role of pilgrim journeying to the Holy Land to visit the Holy Cross. These are the dotok performed in different towns of Camarines Sur. The choreography varies from place to place, but the theme remains the same, which is about Empress Elena's epic journey of searching for the true cross. Another common theme of the dotok is the use of flowers as one of the props. In all dotok that I was able to witness during my data gathering, all performances use flowers as props. Like the dotok, pastora is widely known in the region. Pastora is a tradition performed during Christmas. The theme is about the shepherd's announcement to the people that Jesus Christ is born. The variations in choreography depend from place to place. The costumes and props also vary depending on the tradition observed and the personal belief of the culture varies. Some groups like the ones from Talisay, Camarines Norte, and Tubog Uwas Albay, referred to as Pastores Talisay and Pastores Tubog respectively, use flower arches as props. Flower arches used as props in performances were popular in Europe and Mexico. Other pastora groups used hats, ribbons, and lanterns as props. Highlighting the essence of flowers in our local environment instills awareness in the people. We have to realize that more than ornaments, these flowers form part of our faith and tradition. This awareness should inspire us to continue to grow our local flora as part of the collective effort in sustaining our culture and environment. According to the Native Plant Society in Ohio, there are also other profound reasons for using native plants in our yards. Aesthetically and spiritually, Native plants enhance our sense of place. Native plants are one of the most visible elements in the local landscape. They are part of what makes the region unique. Learning and growing these native plants promote a deeper understanding and respect for the land. That will be all. Diyos Mabalos. Maraming salamat. Thank you. All right, just marvelous also to Dr. Margate. Uh, thank you very much for educating us about the different traditional dances of Bicol. We were able to realize that flowers play a really big role in Philippine dance. Apparently, we always use them as ornaments for the beautification of visual visuals of performances and also for offering to the divine since a lot of our dances are parts of veneration practices and in some cases uh, in rituals also. We were even able to learn more about the forms or basic forms of these dances. Very educational. Like Dr. Buot earlier, Dr. Margate also showed her uh, advocacy in spreading awareness about our dance traditions, especially to the youth. It's very interesting. I didn't realize that flowers do not only appear in art forms like visual arts and literature. Surprisingly, they also inspire dances. Now, uh, I would like to thank all the speakers in the segment for imparting their knowledge to us. Those are very enlightening. Um, but now, I am opening the floor for questions. Feel free to send in your questions through the, through the Zoom chat. All right. Oh, uh, good morning, Dean Carillo. Uh, I think she's here. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, all right. So, um, again, to keep the ball rolling or just to start or give you a nudge in... Um, and formulating your questions. Maybe I can go first. All right. Um, my first question is for Dr. Buot. 
Um, may doc- uh, may, 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 may question for Dr. Buat is, are you allowing these dances to be mixed with other forms of dances or mod- more contemporary or more modern forms of dances? And are these dances open to new untraditional motions? Because we were, we were able to say that there are forms, there are uh, basic movements in, uh, in these dances. Are you allowing more contemporary motions or movements to be mixed with these traditional movements? Hello, good morning. Um, for that question, thank you so much. Um, as of now, for module two, no, not yet. If I'm looking at my um, course guide, um, in- in- innovation or uh, change of the proper proper movements are not are not allowed yet because uh, number one, the movements are too easy. Perhaps they could just change the formation and everything they can do, the other things that would add to the, the beauty of it. But basically, the movements are the same. Not yet. But we will reach to that stage. We will reach mm-hmm. to that stage. Uh, I'm looking at it as a dance course, not mm-hmm. as um, no, the innovation would come later on. Mm-hmm. All right, thank you, Dr. Buot, for answering that question. Um, do you have other questions for Dr. Buot and Dr. Margate? Um, maybe I, I can go again. Uh, I have a question naman for, ano, for Dr. Margate. Um, I have noticed, Dr. Margate, that um, most of your dancers are women. Um, are men um, not allowed to participate? Or if there are men, what are the... What are their roles in these performances? I mean, what are the roles of women and men in these performances? Actually, I also noticed that in the videos that uh, Dr. Buot has uh, has uh, showed us, but maybe we uh, we can uh, go first to Dr. Margate and then Dr. Buot. Yes, good morning. Good morning, ma'am. Yeah, so as I have mentioned earlier, these are traditional dances performed by women. So it's exclusively for women. And if you ask what the role of women, of men, um, uh, there are different roles. Some of them play the role of musicians, uh, props men, and some are choreographers. Actually, originally, the choreographer of Panhardin is a, is a man, it's a male. And even Lagayla, historically, when we when we check historical records, the trainers were male. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Margate. Um, Dr. Buot? Yeah, same here. Actually, the original the original version of Bulaklakan, if I'm taking Bulaklakan right now, they are also composed, or they were, with eight women, eight ladies. But somehow, in the classroom, or even dance presentations, other school presentations, uh, we don't give um, any more, um, what is this, the, a boundary, no? boundary of those things. Because Bulaklakan is not performed um, during a religious ceremony. And like in Lagaylay with Dr. Margate, and, or the other things that they have it's it was or those things were strictly for a church celebration so in bulaklakan i think it's more of a community festival so therefore um, we could not stop people to incorporate other other personalities inside so perhaps that is also good right like um no more boundaries so if you want to dance you can dance so parang wala na tayong role making of it this is for the women this is for the for the male mm-hmm. and so on um this is um easy easier mm-hmm. for bulaklakan because it's a group dance so that's mm-hmm. it all right thank you very much dr buot and dr margate well actually not to uh to to maybe add to that discussion um I'm not. I'm not really sure if this is a question or or a suggestion or 
maybe it's a bit controversial, but um, would you consider, well, Dr. Boat said that maybe in the future it's good that we, we consider not looking at gender when it comes to, to performing these dances. Maybe my question would be, um, well, we say that this is these dances are more on dances for women, but would you be welcome to, um, to having maybe the members of the LGBTQIA community to, to participate in these dances. Maybe we have some, um, some members of, uh, of this community that, that cross-dress or these are trans women. Will you be, do you think that in the future they will be allowed also to, uh, to participate in these dances? Well, this is a question for both Dr. Uh, Margate and Dr. Buot. How about you, Jai? Would you like to go first? Yeah, I can go first. Um, right now, we have um, identified culture bearers in the community, and it's up to them. So, um, me as a researcher, I am not in the position to decide uh, who will be the participants. So, we have culture bearers, and most of them are elderly. So, I don't know if uh now is the they will be open to that um for the time being so maybe in the future who knows but uh right now um it's for human performances only uh except for the except for the dotto where in there is uh constantine and obviously that will be played by by young boys and yeah, in Pastora, they also have Capitan, uh, the lead leader of the Pastora group. It's also portrayed by, by men. But in Lagaylay in, in Panhardin, they are exclusively performed by women. Mm-hmm. All right. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Margate. Uh, Dr. Boat, would you want to uh, add to that? Yeah, um, I believe that when the dance is... Um, church related or religious related there's somehow sensitivity to that so that I, I agree with Dr. Mariate that it would be it would depend so much on the community stakeholders right now in my case because I am doing this in in a line of um, being a faculty teacher being a teacher being a, a faculty member of um, dance um, offering dance courses for example like in our physical education i believe i don't i don't consider that there should be a boundary in the classroom but in, in in doing so i also believe that when we practice it in the community uh for example if we go like um, this is for for performances this is for um fitness sake so I don't believe that we need to have this boundary. For example, uh, in our department, we offer belly dancing as a PE2, or it's one of the activities. And our our instruction um, has this formation, like this is for female only, female only. So I, I questioned that, and I said, there are people, there are like, you mentioned, Ross, like there are some who are cross-dresser. Uh, we have students who, really want to join that mm-hmm. i said let's open it right eh, gusto nila, right Be- because yeah. <laughs> uh, it's one way of relax relaxation re- that's one way of ex- very expressive so um, belly dancing diba? Meron naman pong, we also have um, belly dancers that uh, who are who are males in in the mm-hmm. international arena so i told them why not, why not? Mm-hmm. so i'm open with that all right. Thank you very much, Dr. Buot, and also uh, Dr. Margate for your uh for your answers. It's really I don't know. Um, even if we are living in a very contemporary world right now, no matter how much we're uh no matter how much how um open we are to these uh to these situations, uh, we are really very much influenced by traditional views. And it's a, it's a very uh, sensitive issue for for our traditional uh, or or conservative um, our conservative leaders. Uh, somehow it's it's kind of like that. Uh, we have uh, some questions from the chat that Doctor Labor will be 
uh, reading. I'm sorry because I think our audience cannot uh, send me direct messages. Ah, ma'am, you're muted po. Okay, thank thank you for that, Ms. Hidario. Before I read the question of Ms. Um, of Ms. Uh, Jess Vasco, uh, I just want to like to add a bit to what has been said uh, just now. So, uh, in relation to equity, of, um, which the Faura Project holds very dearly, you know. So, just for everyone to know that our dress up Santa Cruzan, which is our closing ceremony, closing program on day five, it will be May six at seven p.m. Uh, is actually uh, is uh, act, has long been open to participants not just from our traditional female uh from the from usually if you talk about santa cruzan we speak of female participants right but but uh, uh even from way back no our dress up santa cruzan have been receiving um participation from both male and female we just want to share everyone that fact no? and in fact our our no our winner for last year santa cruzan was a male participant si Ace, no? she he had a wonderful um We had wonderful entries to our event. No? So anyway, so I go back to the question of uh, sent by Ms. Uh, Hilar, uh, Ms. Basco. So she said that since the practice, since for practical reasons, makeshift flowers like those made from paper are used, are there are there any quote historical or cultural unquote records of what specific species of flowers are used in these dances? If so. Is a selection of flowers strict? I guess this is um, this can be uh, answered by any of our uh, paper presenters. I would like to answer that, um, Mom Levy. Um, as during my presentations, it, it was indicated in the PowerPoint, in my PowerPoint, that there are specific flowers that that are used in Lagaylay and Hardin. And I also shown there the stanzas for like uh, Abel, uh, Ampaga. They are specifically mentioned. So for nine consecutive nights, the Paralagaylay are using plastic flowers and paper flowers for practical reasons. But during the singing of the lyrics, they specify the name of the flowers so we have to choose flowers which are closest to sampaga or avel uh, for that reason because it's specifically stated in the lyrics all right yes thank you thank you for that uh yes uh we just rosie yes yes uh, in, in uh, my case yeah okay ah uh, sorry um in my case I think um, it's a free-flowing uh, choices. You know? Like when we innovate, we could not stop on stage performances-wise. Like we could not really stop and be be allowing some representative. So in our doing the research, we have what we call the proxy variable. So the same with us, the same with the performers. So on the stage. Uh, we might as well look at it on the the beauty only, right? Like we miss perhaps the the essence, the real essence of the symbolism. Like it's the same with the rose parade, right? The rose festival. Um, they also if um, what innovate or they also evolve. So in time, like they do not use only roses right now. So the same with our with our stage performances, perhaps that. That is really evolving, and number one, number one, um, the only consideration. Like, for example, in the in the school, in the school um, setting, or in the classroom setting, we could not, I could not um, stop them in doing whatever is best for them to replicate the the reality. All right, thank you, Doctor Buot. And actually, no, I, I was able to to. Uh, see also earlier Dr. Margates uh, PowerPoint presentation wherein she she really put all the the images of of uh, of the flowers that they were using and it's really interesting because I didn't think that there there are specific uh, specific flowers that you're supposed to use in in these specific dances so it's really interesting that that our culture or because because probably or or well definitely there's uh, a cultural Uh, a cultural explanation as to why we choose 
to use these flowers, no, Dr. Margate. Well, it's really interesting. I, I really like that there were um, visual visual uh, aids for this uh, for these flowers. So, um, okay, before we end, uh, uh, before we end the Q and A. A portion. Thank you very much, Dr. Buot and Dr. Margate for answering our uh, questions. And I hope the audience members are also uh, very much engaged and uh, they were able to learn also as well as I did uh, from, from their presentations. But before we end the Q&A, uh, Ms. Bing Famoso has an announcement. Ah, okay. Um... Again, um, thank you so much for uh, for inviting us, the Philippine Botanical Art Society, to this uh, wonderful festival and international conference. So on behalf of the FARA project, the University of the Philippines Manila, the Philippine Botanical Art Society, and Artist Space, I would like to invite you to celebrating native flora in the time of pandemic, a botanical art exhibition at the Artist Space Gallery in Unimart, Capital Commons, Pasig City. Um, the launch is on May 6th, that will be on Friday, and a simple opening program will start at 4 o'clock p.m. Um, around 30 field bus artists will be exhibiting their work. So we hope to see you there. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you very much, Ms. Bing. Okay. Um, now, uh, thank you everyone again for actively participating in the Q&A. Uh, and to our speakers, thank you very much for being here. But before we proceed with the next uh, uh, next segment, we at the Power Project would like to show our appreciation to our speakers through these certificates of appreciation. Allow me to read the citation. Please uh, flash our um, certificates for the speakers. All right. Okay. Uh, the Fowler Pro again, the Fowler Project Incorporated with Philippine Botanical Art Society and the University of the Philippines, Manila, present this certificate of appreciation to uh, Jai uh, A. Margate or Dr. Margate for speaking on exploring the motif of flowers in four Bicolano traditional dances given this third day of May 2022. Uh, during the conference plenary on celebrating heroes and heritage dance advocates during the 2022 International Flores de Mayo Festival and Conference. Signed, Dr. Honey Libertine at Sanzar Labor, again, uh, Professor Alice Adeva and Ms. Bing Famoso. Uh, next, also, Certificate of Appreciation to Dr. Uh, Mer Merites Buot for Speaking on Flowers Among the Philippine Dances. Uh, again, signed by Dr. Labor, Professor Deva, and Ms. Bing. Alright, so uh, maybe we can uh, invite now uh, Ma'am Alice Adeva, the chairperson of, uh, of the ACR, the Department of Arts and Communication, to, um, uh, to introduce our dearest Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. Good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure for me to introduce Prof. Maria Constancia Obrero Carillo, Professor of Biochemistry and Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. While Professor Carillo's training is in drug discovery and biochemistry, she has been very generous in her support of the arts, particularly the initiatives that we have started at the Department of Arts and Communication. We are gratified by this continuous support from Dr. Carillo. In turn, we are committed to supporting her administration's trusts in maintaining a presence for culture and the arts in an otherwise predominantly science-oriented institution. From today's festival and conference to creative work folios and everything in between, we seek to prove ourselves worthy of her confidence in us. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dean Maria Constancia Carillo. Thank you very much, Ma'am Alice, for that uh, very generous um, introduction. 
So good morning to all guests, speakers, and participants. I am grateful to all of you for taking the time to join us in the 2022 International Flores de Mayo Festival and Conference, Floral Traditions in the Time of Pandemic. The demands of living are such that we may unwittingly ignore beauty in the everyday, but our floral heritage reminds us that there's beauty to be found everywhere at every time. And I was really glad to listen at least to the tail end of our speakers' talks today. Uh, one of my fondest childhood memories as a Bicolano, I'm from, I'm from Camarines Sur, is joining Flores de Mayo in our hometown, offering flowers gathered in our neighborhood in a church service and getting yummy snacks afterwards. So, you know, that was quite a treat uh, as a young child. And it was something that I really looked forward to every summer. And of course, you know, there's the annual Santa Cruzan and every young girl aspired to be one of the beautiful lasses walking under flower bedeck. Arches, of course, me included. Uh, even now, I love seeing flowers of all kind bloom, especially at this time of year. Indeed, floral heritage unifies us, paying no mind to race and creed. The gumamela, bougainvillea, Turkish tulips, Indian flowers remind us that life on land remains beautiful and that there remains plenty of hope for sustainable cities and communities for as long as flowers bloom. In times like this, when it's so much easier to retreat to the familiar that comes with our respective disciplines and training. You know, I'm a biochemist, but I really do still appreciate flowers in all its form. The conference is proof that, is, that there is plenty of worth in looking at areas of convergence. So this festival is an intersection indeed of the arts and sciences. The intangible cultural heritage of floral festivals stand side by side with the scientists and intellectuals whose unstinting work has led to the discovery and indeed development of flowers that now carry their very names. I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the support of the, of the FAURA Project Incorporated, the Philippine Botanical Art Society, and the National Commission for Culture and the Arts in bringing the festival and conference to life. And I am grateful to Dr. Levi Achenlebor, Professor of Philippine Arts from DAC, College of Arts and Sciences, for bringing us together in the celebration of the hope and beauty of flowers. Again, my congratulations to everyone who contributed to this year's FARA project. See you again next year, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you very much, Dr. Carrillo, for our Dean uh, Maricon, our very own Dean Maricon. Um, uh, for your, uh, thank you very much for your inspiring remarks. It's, it's very fitting, pala, that that you're closing this, this session since you are, uh, since you have your own experiences in Flores de Mayo, and you can very <laughs> much relate to our uh, session uh, session talks. So. Uh, we are now at the end of the second day of our week-long festival. Thank you so much to everyone for being here today to participate in this celebration with us. Personally, I was really interested in our sessions as I have been studying and working on Philippine arts and culture for about eight years now, and a lot of the topics are still really new to me. So personally, I am very much inspired by these talks. I hope uh, our audience members felt the same way too. We were, uh, we are, or we were educated uh, about the great importance of Filipinos and uh, great importance Filipinos and Asians give to flowers and our forms of art. Flowers have been part of our everyday lives, and that is very much reflected in our cultures. We were not only educated, but we were inspired by our speakers' personal and social advocacies when it comes to arts and flowers. We are very much inspired as well, and I hope everyone enjoyed and learned a lot from our speakers today. But before we formally end, may we please request everyone to turn on their cameras for a quick picture taking. Gab, I hope you're ready for uh, the picture taking. All right. Okay, I don't know if we have a lot of pages, but okay, let's, uh, let's turn on our cameras if we can. Let me see those beautiful faces. Okay. Right. We have um we have a lot of audience members turning on their cameras. All right. If uh Gab, if you're ready, uh can you uh tell us if we can yes, freeze now? All right. Okay. 
Okay, guys. Uh, three, two, one, smile. One more pop. Okay. Yes. Three, two, one, smile. Why na po? All right. Thank you very much, Gab. And thank you very much, everyone, for turning on your cameras for that. Now, before we leave the Zoom room, we would like to request everyone here to scan the QR code or, the, or click the link sent to the Zoom chat to access our evaluation form. Please note that only those who answered the evaluation form may request for a certificate of attendance. And uh, we also uh, attached our Gcash account, our QR code. So uh, you may also donate through our account. All right, before we let you go, I would first like to run down the remaining uh, activities that we have for our Flores de Mayo celebration this year. Uh, for our, well, this is day, day two. We have day three, our on-site uh, on painting exhibit celebrating native flowers in the time of, of pandemic and collaboration with Artist Space and Philippine Botanical Artists Society, just like what Ms. Bing uh, promoted earlier. Uh, day four, or May uh, 5, 2022, we I have our... Uh, Rosie, can I inter Yes, uh, this is what uh, Ms. Bing Famoso uh, announced earlier, that mm -hmm. the May, uh, the third day, that would be May 4 event, the exhibit, has been moved to our day five. This will be oh, part of our closing right. ceremony. Yeah, so this will be on May 6th uh, at 4 p.m. Tama ba, Bing? Yes, yes. po, ma'am. Tama po. Uh, thank you for that correction, uh, Ma'am Levy and Miss Bing. Uh, on, the, uh, on May 5, we have workshops, painting and crafting endemic flowers. Uh, at 9 a.m., we have the vid video premiere of on-site crocheting art, heritage and livelihood launch and workshop. Our first workshop will be uh, by Miss Carla Sahona of uh, Philbas. And then our second workshop is by Miss Bing Famoso. And our third workshop will be by Miss Isa Domingo. They're all from Philbas. And for our uh, day five, which is May 6, uh, we will be showing the video premiere of Memories of Power Up prepared by Elijah Del Rosario and Marinel Completo, both senior students of the BA Philippine Arts Cultural Heritage and Arts Management Program. And we will also be, uh, there will also be uh, Power Trails promoting heritage and sustainability hosted by Ms. Moirin uh, or will be lectured by Ms. Moirin Espinosa of De La Salle University Taft. And we also have uh, on day 5, May 6, the Dress Up Santa Cruzan, which will be moderated by Charisse Del Castillo, a senior student of our uh, Phil Arts program as well. So I hope you will be joining us uh, in the remaining events of uh, the 2022 uh, Flores de Mayo Festival and Conference. So again, thank you very much, everyone, for uh, for participating today. And thank you very much, Dean uh, Maricon, for being with us. And also our speakers for being with us today. So thank you and happy lunch. Take care and stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so the um, the evaluation link has also been placed in our chat box. Huh? So it can be through the uh, QR code on the left side of the screen or to our chat box. And I think on the right side uh, is, is the link for our uh, for uh, past groups who might like to donate huh? to uh, to our um, for the conference ex or for the festival extent. Thank you again. So uh, schedule this afternoon is the ingress of our paintings, not to the gallery. <laughs> They'll start working on them. So to prepare um, the paintings for our exhibit on Friday. Uh, good luck, uh, Phil Bass. Good, um, good luck, Miss Bing Famoso and the Phil Bass team for this. <laughs>